Okay. Thank you. And once again, welcome to the King James Bible Baptist Church. Uh, turn your Bible to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to read. Uh, I know it seems like we're never going to get out of chapter 1, but I promise you, Lord willing, we will. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to start reading in verse 4, and we're going to read through verse 17. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, desires, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they, they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, that's queers, gays and lesbians, if that was a question, for liars, for perjured persons, that's a whole other level of lying, that's people who have sworn to their lie, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine meaning all these things are contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, that is to say, I hurt people, I injured people by the way that I was, but I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding but abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. For a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be glory, be honor and glory for ever and ever. Amen. Dear God, please help me as I prayed. I can't do it without you. Fill me with your spirit. Give me the words to say. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right. Now just by way of introduction, we've preached, and I won't re-preach it except to the extent of referring to it, um, verse 3, verse 4, verse, and especially verse 5. For the past three weeks, um, I've shown you how that the purpose of teaching no other doctrine is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. And that's where the warfare is. And that's what you have to fight to hold on to and keep, uh, as it said in verse 19, holding faith in a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. And by the way, uh, I'll say it again, Paul didn't hesitate to name names, Hymenaeus and Alexander. He did it all the time. Bible names names all the time. Read your Bible if you, you know, you're one of those folks who say that, well, you can preach against sin, but you don't have to name them. Well, you can take it up with the Holy Spirit, because that's exactly what he did in these cases. All right, now, I won't re-preach all of that, but I do need to remind you of it, uh, because it's in the direct context of everything that we're going to talk about tonight, or everything I'm going to preach to you, God helping me. And the first thing I want you to notice, um, by way of introduction, is the clarity, the pungency, and the and the certainty of the way these things are worded. Uh, when I was a boy, God dealt with me about being truthful. I remember the conversation I had with my dad in the basement next to the woodpile. Jeff, when are you going to learn to stop lying? 
What's so hard about just being honest? If I have a question, why can't you just tell me the truth? Don't you know that I love you? Why can't I trust you? See? And I didn't immediately become truthful right then, but that conversation worked on me and worked on me day after day and month after month and year after year. And even to this day, I have that conversation in my head and remember it every time I think about hiding something from Anne Marie, which I would never dare to do. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> And even in all the places that I messed up, I should say, it wasn't that I wasn't raised right. My daddy raised me right. He taught me right. And I knew better when I messed up. But let me tell you something else. Because of my father, after I messed up, I knew what to do to get straight again. See? Because the Bible recognizes and accounts and I won't say accommodates, but gives us the way to get right after having sinned, even as a Christian. Because the Bible deals in truth and in reality. And in those things, uh, we don't need to make euphemisms. We don't need to change the words to make them more palatable. Uh, there's a whole body of Greek uh, professors of professors is the word used in Romans chapter 1, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. There's a whole library of men who have made their living and created an entire culture in Christianity and made merchandise of the church by teaching them how to change the words, how to make them nice. Uh, the New King James Bible promotes itself by saying, well, it's based on the same manuscript, so it's right, uh, but we just changed the word so that it's more intelligible in modern English. No, that's a lie! You change the words not to make them more intelligible, you change them, and you change the meaning of what they said! In the Bible, that's called speaking lies and hypocrisy. In the Bible, that's called desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they, aff they affirm. From which comes the expression, you don't know what you're talking about. See? How many of you have heard that expression in your life? I've, I've heard it more than once. People have said it to me. I've said it to other people. It's a common expression. And it comes from 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6. Uh, excuse me, verse 7. In reference uh, to the very people that I'm preaching against uh, right now. And so... The Bible teaches us not to use euphemisms. Uh, they're fables. They're not another way of looking at it. They're speaking lies and hypocrisy. Not he said, she said. Not a matter of opinion. Uh, there is one truth uh, God dealt with me about in the King James Bible. There is one word of God, not over 200 in our language. See? And it's not, it's not well, how readest thou? Although Jesus did ask that question. He didn't ask that question because he thought he was going to get an honest answer. He wanted to know how the man would answer. And he did know. Amen. It's authoritative teaching of the Word of God, not inductive Bible study where everybody goes around and says their opinion so that you go away at the end of the night with a question, not an answer. See? All right. They're fables. They're fables. Uh, not uh, a different perspective. Not their fables. Not our our Catholic friends who teach it this way. No, that's not how the Bible words it. See, in in order for you to behave properly, in order for you to take the right action, in order for you to have the right, uh, in order to take the right action, you have to have the right understanding. In order to have the right understanding, you have to have the clarity and the certainty that God gives us in his words. Which means don't euphemize them. Don't find another word that you think they'll accept. If it's something that was spoken by the Holy Spirit, then it's safe to say. Amen. And you say, well, they're just not going to hear it, and I just don't know if they can handle that. Well, then they're not going to handle it, but you should say it. And you should say it in the spirit in which it's written. Amen. And depending on the situation, if you're trying to give somebody comfort, then you should say it in a comforting tone. Amen. And by the way, I am comforted when I hear good, hard preaching. 
And when I hear bad guys getting railed at, getting railed is not the right word. When I hear bad guys being rebuked and reproved and exhorted with all long suffering and doctrine, when I hear bad guys being convinced of sin, then that comforts me because it gives me hope that there's still good preaching in the world. Amen. It gives me hope that somebody heard what the Holy Spirit was saying besides me. And I know that there are others besides me. I can name, you know, less than five. But there's also, I believe, no one believed that there's over 7,000. Uh, according to Romans chapter 11, which is talking about Israel. But I can, if I can make the application to, uh, to today. Uh, desiring to be teachers of the law understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. So I've already made the point before how that they turn aside from unfeigned faith, which ought to be clear enough. You don't believe the Bible, so you make up other stuff that's not the Bible. You turn aside from charity out of a pure heart because you're not loving anybody by by stealing from them direct direct access to what God says so that you can fill your coffers. You're not loving anybody by doing that. You're not loving anybody with your uh, nuggets from the Greek New Testament. You're not loving anybody. You're perverting and resting the scripture to your own destruction and your, and also the destruction of everybody that follows you. See? And you might think you have a good conscience towards God, but you're lying. Your conscience is seared with a hot iron. You don't have a pure conscience, as we talked about. All right, now I want you to look at verse 7. Verse 7. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. And I want you to take note of the fact that the people that Paul is accusing, the people that he's mentioning, the people that he's preaching against, the men who he is condemning as have not having faith, but having put away concerning faith, uh, or have good conscience, putting away their good conscience, uh, and, uh, concerning faith have made shipwreck, uh, verse 19. Those are not men who are overt enemies of the Word of God. We're not talking about Bertram Russell, the famous atheist, because there are no famous atheists anymore, because, you know what? Most people are atheists in the world today. If not in, in belief, at least in practice. Uh, Dr. Ruckman used to use the expression practical atheists. I remember the first line I ever read out of one of his books was, all theistic evolutionists are practical, uh, practical atheists. And I just broke out laughing when I read that because I'd never heard something so clear and so profound at the same time. Is you go, you can go ahead and peddle that mess and make a whole industry in a in a theme park, uh, out of selling it. But I ain't buying it. I'm over here trying to hold faith and a good conscience. Amen. And though I'm just as susceptible of buying it, and there were times where I was tempted to buy it, and in my flesh I could have bought it, God have mercy on me. It's my responsibility. It's my sacred trust, verse 11, to hold faith and a good conscience. And so I'm not going to your theme park. And by theme park, I mean Bible college. <laughs> Amen. Um, not anymore. Uh, but I want you to notice that the, so they're not overt enemies of the Word of God. They're not, um, you know, Charles Manson. They're not, um, um, Jeffrey Dahmer. They're not famous bad guys. They're not Rasputin. They're not people who are famous enemies of Christianity, of Jesus Christ. Everybody knows those are bad guys. These are men who desire to be teachers of the law. They are Sunday school teachers and pastors who have the perhaps the calling and the sacred trust of delivering the word of God to you and have made shipwreck of that. I just don't understand. How about my pastor? He's such a godly man and he does this. He lied. He told you a fable. He sold you down the river for a shekel. 
He was supposed to be watching for your soul. He was supposed to be protecting you from wolves. He was supposed to be praying over you. He was supposed to be telling you the truth. He was supposed to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. But instead, he got in his head that it was more important that he have a big congregation. And so somewhere along the line, he lost the truth, even though he kept learning. That's 99% of all preachers today. That I'll go a step further. That's 99%. I'm making up the number. Forgive me. That the number's not right. It's a guess. But uh, in my experience of the preachers that I know, that I've dealt with, that I grew up around, that's 99% of all God of all God called preachers of the Word of God, who call themselves men of God, who are trained in the Word of God, but having not been taught the Word of God. See. So you just can't rely on church culture. You can't rely on what you heard in Bible college. You have to learn, son, to go straight to the words of this book and hear from God directly by His Spirit. Because God helping me, I pray, I pray every day that I give it to you right. And that is my job and that is what I'm, I'm trying to do. But you need to learn how to get it from here directly. Because I won't always be here. I'm going to die one day if if uh, the Lord tarries. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know, and so the law here technically is referring in the context to uh, the, the Old Testament law and Jews who've been converted who desire to be teachers of the law, but they don't understand it. Uh, and so they pervert it, um, which is a misuse of the law. Look at verse 8. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, meaning that everything that he just talked about is an unlawful use of the law. See, because if you use it lawfully, then it's good. But if you misuse it, then it's not good. <laughs> At least your misuse of it is not good. It's good, no matter what you do. Um, but the Bible, Dr. Ruffin used to say it this way. He said, the Bible is a two-edged sword. It'll cut you both ways. See? If your heart isn't right with God, if you're playing some kind of a game with God, you'll go in there and that Bible just shred you to pieces and condemn you and leave you on the side of the road. But if you come to the, and it'll confuse you and you'll pray about it and God will let you believe a lie and even send a lying spirit to, to lead you into a lie. Ezekiel 14. But if you want to know the truth, God will show it to you. He won't lie to you. But we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. So, so there are a multitude of people who desire to be teachers of the law, who understand either what they say nor whereof they affirm. And uh, one application that I can make is just about every Sunday school teacher who's charged with the responsibility of giving the Word of God to children. And a common thing that you hear from them when you call them on the fact that they don't know the Bible any farther than they can find it when they get out of bed in the morning is, well, kids at that age, they just need love. They don't need truth. No, they need love and truth. They need speaking the truth in love. They need wherefore putting away lying. What you're giving them is, is not love, but false, but something that you pretend is love and lie about, uh, love because you profess to know God, but in works deny Him. What you're doing is is making stuff up and reading something from the Southern Baptist monthly curriculum or wherever you got it from that has nothing to do with what's being said in the Word of God. And you're giving that to children at an age where they're going to remember it for the rest of their lives. You liar. If you don't know, then you should sit down and shut up until you know. Amen. You got no business teaching a Sunday school class if you don't know the Bible well enough to teach it, especially to children who are, what's the word, uh, impressionable. 
and are are just blank slates and who absorb and take everything you say to heart. See, that affects the, how they're going to come out when they grow up. I could say the same thing to you, fathers, to you, wives, to you, parents. You need to know the Bible so that you can give it to your children. And I don't mean academically. You need to learn these lessons from God by practicing what you read in the Bible so that God can show you what he means when he says these things. And you can experience them and live them out. And then having learned those lessons that way, in the words of Hebrews chapter 5, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil, then you'll give your kid a chance. Then there's hope for that kid to find God, to not be a fake and a liar. See, And God being God, there's always hope for everybody. Amen. God commanded his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But Jesus said, if ye, being evil, <laughs> know how to give good gifts unto your children, see, don't you want your kid to have it straight? Don't you love your kid more than yourself? Don't you want him to have the things that God's given you and go further and learn more? Don't you want your life not to be in vain because you did something right by passing it on to your kid, even though you messed up a thousand other times, a thousand other ways every day of your life? Every parent wants that for their kid. So, don't be a desire to be teachers of law, understanding neither what they say nor what they affirm. Find out what God says. Learn. Put it into practice. Try them. Try them. Try God out on these things. Obey Him. Do right and let the chips fall, as my dad used to say. All right, so there's a, mis a way to misuse the Word of God, verse 8. But we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. That's the proper use. Uh, but then there's a misuse of it, giving heed to fables and endless genealogies. And I want you to notice what we learn from verse 7 is that the fables and, e and endless genealogies can often find their root... In the teaching of the Word of God. So, if uh, turn to first, uh, Second Peter, Second Peter chapter one, Second Peter chapter one, and look in verse sixteen. Actually, back up to verse uh, twelve. Therefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. So he says, you already know these things, and you're already established in them, but I'm going to remind you again, verse 13, yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. See? So as long as I am in this tabernacle, that's his body, as long as he's here, he's going to keep telling us over and over again. He's going to keep reminding us of these same things over and over again. Uh, stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Verse 14. Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. I'm about to die. Verse 15. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. I'm going to remind you, I'm going to remind you, I'm going to remind you so you don't forget. I want, I want it to be so that 50 years after I'm dead, you still remember these things that I said to you over and over again a thousand times. Verse 16, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So this is referring to the Mount of Transfiguration when they saw him on the mountain and they heard his voice from heaven and were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And he says, we didn't make that up. We weren't following cunningly devised fables. But notice the wording, cunningly devised fables, and how it's in reference to something that they saw and heard concerning Jesus Christ. 
So the cunningly devised fables are not, you know, Aesop's fables. They are perverse things that people make up about the Word of God and Jesus Christ. And Peter says, we didn't make those things up. They actually happen, and we have something that's even more sure than that, verse 19, which is the Word of God. All right, turn to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And look in verse uh, 3. For the time will come, so back up to verse 2. Preach the word, actually, back up to verse 1. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. So there's two judgments there. And Paul says, before I exhort you, I just want you to remind you of the fact that you're going to stand before Jesus Christ and give account of yourself. So before I say what I'm about to say, just keep that in your mind. Preach the word. Be instant. In season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. That's why everybody wants to be a teacher, not a preacher. That's why everybody wants to just, uh, cause it's a spirit that's in the air, that's satanic. Now there's anything wrong with teaching, but there is something wrong with not preaching. Amen. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So if it's not true, it's a fable. Amen. All right. Um, one more. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> not only is it a fable, it's a cunningly devised fable uh, where we just read in Second Peter 1. Somebody put some thought they put some time and energy into 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 uh, carefully uh, putting that fable together in a way that people would believe it. Uh, it took some forethought. It took some design, uh, if you forgive my word from apologetics. It 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 took some craft for somebody to sit there and think about how they could they could form this lie. Uh, and make it comprehensive enough so that people would believe it and accept it. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, and look in verse um, 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men. See? How are we carried about with every wind of doctrine? By the slight of men, number one. That is men uh, slighting. <laughs> And cunning craftiness, that's cunningly devised fables, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Back when I used to be at war one time, I remember um, I said to the person I was at war with, if you forgive the reference, I said, um, and this was wicked and evil, but it's an example of lying in wait, where I just said to him, well, why don't you come out and talk to me like a man? You know, you're gonna you're gonna destroy my family, you're gonna destroy my my life, you're gonna say bad things about me, and um, why not just come out and deal with me directly like a man? That's your whole that's your whole argument is that I'm not a man, that I'm not a good guy, that I can't that I um, can't shouldn't be allowed to have children or reproduce or have a family, that I have nothing to offer anybody. So why don't you come out? Why don't you come out? I'm sitting here waiting for you, is how I worded it. And that was wicked and evil for me to say. But I want you to take that and remember it and notice that that is exactly what these people who don't believe the Bible or who say that they know God but in works deny Him are doing to, to, to bring, to, to lure you to seduce you away from the faith of Jesus Christ, which is in simplicity and in truth. See, they're lying in wait to deceive. Which I wasn't lying in wait to deceive anybody. I had something else in mind, which was wicked and evil. But lying in wait there, see, 
And let me t- and verse 15 gives the solution. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Okay, I'll speak the truth, but I just but uh but that's not enough cuz he says it and there's two ways to say things. Sometimes you can say I you can stop lying or you can say you can tell the truth. And if you only say one of those two things, then that gives a deceitful heart occasion uh, to find a loophole. Dr. Orpin called it lies of omission. See? But the Bible covers it. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love. All right, now look down in verse uh, 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So which way do you want it? The Bible gives it to you both ways. Don't lie and tell the truth. And uh, there's many ways in that in which that could be applied. But as a minister of Jesus Christ, uh, in all things, especially in the personal choices that you make as to how you understand these words, how you take them, and you should take them as they stand, as they are, literally. You should not pervert them. You should not rest them. You should not take them out of context. You should not make try to force them to say something that they don't say. I don't care what your motive is. When you do that, you are seduced or you are seducing. You're an evil man and seducer, waxing worse and worse. And that's every one of you. Every one of us that could happen to. Every one of us, the temptation is there. So don't do that. Do that with other books. Don't do, don't do it at all. But certainly don't do that with the holy, precious word of words that proceed out of God's mouth. Because God's got some things to say about that. And you are going to stand before him and give answer. And you're going to say, well, this reason? He's going to say, that's not what I asked you. Well, my wife didn't. That's not what I asked you. Well, I wasn't raised. That's not what I asked you. I told you in plain words, in my own words, I spoke to you. I walked with you in the cool of the day. And I gave you the precious, holy, sacred trust of my own words in your own language. And I gave you understanding. And I showed you my love towards you. I'm not asking any other questions. I want to know why you didn't do what I said. I want to know why you were so much of a coward that you just couldn't be honest in whatever situation that you felt you had to observe some lying vanity is is how it's going to go at the judgment seat of Christ. For me as well. For all of us. Don't do that. See? The Bible doesn't mince words. And you shouldn't mince words. All right? Now, that's a misuse of the Word of God, just like there's a way to misuse the law. So in the Bible, we're here talking about um, the law with respect to the Old Testament law. We're also making the application of the Word of God. So there's a way to misuse the Word of God, and that's to use it as a way to extort men out of their money or to extort under the guise of doing right. Or to extort by uh, putting them under a system that they're not under. (laughs) Amen. Yeah, I know. Uh, Muzzle not the ox that treadeth out the corn, and that's right. Uh, God hath ordained that they that preach the gospel should live the gospel. That's right. Amen. That's good and right. But that is not what you're doing. What you're doing is removing the element of faith, both from your practice and from their practice, by making it a commandment. And a set amount, which is a standard percentage, uh, which the Bible never told you to do, Christian. That's a, that's a misuse of the Word of God. Uh, so we're not only making the application to the law, but we're, and that's a misuse of the law, by the way, to put a bunch of Christians under it when they're not under it. <laughs> but the, but there's a proper use of the law. And a proper use of the law is to convince men of sin. Amen. For all sin and come short of the glory of God. And you'll go to hell like a maggot and burn. You will burn. Here, put your hand out here and let me put a flame under it. Let me see how long you can tolerate it. 
and then imagine your whole body writhing around like a worm uh, on top of a bunch of other worms. You know what Jesus Christ said? Where their worm dieth not and their fire is not quenched. That's you, pal. Believe it. It's your job, preacher, to make them believe it, to convince them as they come out of the bar and you hand them a track. See? That's a proper use of the Word of God. Well, Jesus Christ never talked that way. He talked more about hell than any other thing. That was his favorite thing to preach on. That's a proper use of the Word of God. Uh, to convince men of sin so that they can get saved. Uh, turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. There is a way to use the Word of God properly. Uh, to learn how to uh, discern between good and evil. To have your senses exercised. Uh, Hebrews chapter 5 is is the dis- definition of what it means to be skillful in the Word. Uh, turn to Galatians 3 and look down in verse uh, 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? Why, why do we have the law if the promise was given to Abraham, if the inheritance was given to Abraham by promise? Why do we even need the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. That's Christ, according to verse 16. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Which means a couple of things. It means we don't need the Word of God. We don't need the law, the Old Testament law, after Christ, because now we have Christ. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So a proper use of the law is to to uh, convince men of sin, to condemn all men officially as being sinners, so that the gospel of Jesus Christ can be offered freely to all men. Or in the words of the verse, by faith, uh, the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Which tells us that before Jesus Christ, you had to get saved by works, uh, mixed with faith. And that's not what I'm preaching on tonight, but this is a proper use of the law. To convince men of sin, of their own sin, of the magnitude and, and sinfulness of their sin, in Romans chapter 7, that sin might become exceeding sinful, uh, it says, so that folks can get saved. A proper use of the law is, or excuse me, of the word of God is to make you aware of your, uh, of the grace and of the mercy that you stand in, in Jesus Christ. He said, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He says, grace be to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says it over and over and over again. He says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. See? And those things are meant to be a comfort to you. And that knowledge is meant to help you to keep from sin. Amen. That's a Bible memory is a proper use of the law. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Getting understanding is a proper use of the law. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. He said. Notice the extremes. He that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not up with me scattereth abroad, Jesus Christ said in one place. Comfort from the word of God. Increase of faith in God through his words is a proper use of the word of God. And that's something that the preacher should constantly be trying to give to his people. More faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, how do you do that, brother? You do it by preaching what the Bible says. You do it by following the instructions in the Bible. You do it by taking, making the hard choices of delivering such a one to the... Um, to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. See, when it's time to do that. 
And you do that by receiving him back again when he repents and going out of your way to forgive him and love him. Amen. And all those things, which I'm also not preaching on tonight. But, but what I am preaching on is the proper use of the word of God. Turn to Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. A proper use of the word of God doesn't ever need to change what the words are saying in English. Second Peter chapter 3 and look in verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, that's new heaven and new earth, uh, verse 13, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, notice the emphasis on peace, without spot, and blameless, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. See, not salvation from hell, but uh, salvation from condemnation at the judgment seat of Christ. I, I, uh, I believe, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. So keep your finger there in 1 Timothy chapter 1. And he said, we read it already in verse 16. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Uh, so back in Second Peter, he said, the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. So that's the long suffering of, of the Lord towards us, just like in Timothy, it was the long suffering of the Lord towards Paul when he was going around acting stupid as a lost guy. In zeal, long suffering. He said, I put up with you, I let you live. That by his mercies we're not consumed, the Bible says in Lamentations. So every day that passes, that you're not punished for your sin, is a day that God is long-suffering towards you, saved or lost. And God did that with Paul to show a pattern to everyone else that would believe. To make it clear that this is the pattern. I want the worst sinner from Sin Street. I want the worst guy doing the worst things, even though he did it ignorant and unbelief. I want the guy, the murderer, the injurious, the blasphemer. I want the guy who should be stoned by all rights under the law in the way that he treated my son. And I'm going to save him and I'm going to use him. But in the meantime, while he's still acting that way, I'm going to be long-suffering towards him. And I dare say, even after he got saved, just like after you and I got saved, and we continue to kick against the pricks and resist the plain truth of the Word of God and allow ourselves to be seduced and deceived by men of corrupt minds destitute uh, concerning the truth because we didn't follow the instructions to uh, withdraw thyself from them. First Timothy 6. See? God's long-suffering to us in those things. And even being delivered unto Satan is an act of long suffering, that he might be saved in the day of Christ. See, First Corinthians five. But look back in Second uh, Peter chapter three, in verse sixteen, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. Okay, granted, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. See, they're unlearned and unstable, but they don't they don't just say, well, I don't know and I'm trying to learn. Please help me. They insist on teaching their wrong, false knowledge. As they do also the other scriptures to the, unto their own destruction. They rest the scriptures. See. And so that's all around. That's everybody. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for whoremongers, for, for, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, 
for perjured persons, and if there be another thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which is committed to my trust. Which means all these things in verses 3 through 10 about teaching no other doctrine is in accordance with the gospel of the blessed God, verse 11, which was committed to my trust. You know how I always say there's more to the gospel than 1 Corinthians 15? Well, here's an example. Here's an example. So there's a proper use of scripture. There's a, there's a, a way to use it for good. To read it every day and draw comfort and hope from it. Uh, to, to receive it as it is in truth, the word of God, uh, not the word of men. Uh, first, uh, first Thessalonians 2.13. Uh, to believe it. To apply it to your life. Not as, and I don't mean that as a catchphrase, as a buzzword. We need to apply it to our life. No, you need to read the, read the verses and obey them. Put them into practice. Do them. So do, in the words of verse 4. See? So do. Alright, now, um, we just read it, so we won't read it again, but I'll, I'll, I want you to notice that Paul, he was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious, but he obtained mercy. So what that tells me is that mercy is available to anyone who comes to God for it. Saved or lost. If you're a lost guy, you're going to hell, you can get mercy from Jesus Christ. If you're a saved guy and you messed up, you can get mercy from Jesus Christ. If you lied, if you filled your life with filth, if you made a living on corruption, whatever it is that you did or are doing, and you're not, you don't see how it can possibly work out if you repent. I promise you, you can have mercy from Jesus Christ. He offers it to you freely. Because he loves you as his son. Amen. Whether you're messed up or not. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. So, verse 15, this is a good thing to say. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And that is the reason why he came into the world. But that's not what's being said in verse 16. What he says is, okay, that's why he came into the world. But this is the reason why he saved me. So that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. See, he picked me because I was injurious and a persecutor uh, and a blasphemer. But I obtained mercy because I did it in unbelief. But he wanted to show a pattern of long suffering. He wanted to show everybody that he's long suffering to us word. So that when you think of God, you don't think, well, I'm going to go repent to God. He's just going to strike me dead and send me to hell no matter what I do because I'm so wicked and evil. He's going to say, yeah, you are wicked and evil. I know that. And I took care of that when I died on the cross for your sin. Well, I know that and I'm already saved. But I, you know, for tasted of the heavenly gift and turned to turn willingly sinned, you know, Hebrews 6 or Hebrews 10. You know, and all these arguments that people make about turning away after you're saved and how you can go to hell after that. No. Jesus Christ showed mercy and long-suffering to Paul, not just in his instance, but as a pattern. Just like the seven days of creation week are a pattern of 7,000 years of history. So God's long-suffering towards Paul is a pattern to the way he feels and deals with, forgive the rhyme, way he feels about all of us who are at peace with him by faith. Long-suffering. Long-suffering. Now, that's an important thing to remember when you're in the middle of a war and have enemies. Amen. 
Because the war, as in all things, at all times, for the Christian, is internal. Uh, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, he said in in Ephesians chapter 6. Another place he said, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. And so here he says, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. So more important than you convincing them of their sin and them repenting is 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 whether or not you hold faith in a good conscience when it comes to this warfare. Because people, friends, family, they're going to come and go. Friends, family, people that you love, people that you grew up with, people that you know, your best buddy that you went to war with, uh, your 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 friend from high school, your friend in Bible college, whoever it is, your best buddy. Uh, that you think is true hearted. It's going to be a warfare that you have to fight. When they decide not to hold faith. And want to seduce you away from the faith. Whether that be your father or mother. Or your cousin. Or your best friend from Bible college. See. That is a warfare. And that is a hard warfare. And that's why these hard words are used. Like turned aside under vain jangling. So you can keep it clear in your mind. No, you're messing up. Well, can't you see where I'm coming from? No, it's not my job to see where you're coming from. It's my job to let you know that you're messing up so that you don't mess up. See? It's my job to preach the fire out of you. It's my job to put you in remembrance so that 50 years after I'm dead, you still remember the words that came out of my mouth. It's my job to charge you that you teach no other doctrine and that you quit acting in a way that is contrary to sound doctrine. And we'll get into um, specifically more how your countenance should be in different situations in 2 Timothy 2 um, verse 24 and the servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men apt to teach patient in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves Uh, but that has a context and there is a even though God wants us to be united he wants Christians to be of one accord, of the same mind, of the same judgment, striving together for the faith of the gospel, Philippians chapter 1. There is inevitable division caused not by you preaching the truth or insisting on adherence to the truth, but by divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. So hold faith in a good conscience. Keep it clear in your mind um, about what these things mean, what they are, what they say. Uh, And when when you look at something, you should not fill your mind with other thoughts that you understand separately from the way that the Bible instructed us. You should, you should, just like when you're learning your words as a, as a child, or when you learn a foreign language, you know, you put, have a flashcard and you put it on the item, spoon, fork, couch, TV, bicycle, you know, whatever it is, fireplace, you know, you learn the word. Let the word of God tell you what those words are, not your euphemized lesser perversion of what they are, so that you can save them in a way that people will accept them. Because the idea is not to make it acceptable. The idea is for them to accept what's true. Which they will or they won't. It's your job to hold faith in a good conscience no matter how they respond. Whether that be your friend, your brother, your children. Hold faith in a good conscience. Which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. 
All right. That's all I got tonight. Would you close the word of prayer? Lord, thank you for the word. I pray that your word will continue to be glorified. That we will do things um, with the right intentions, the right motives, obeying you. Um, charity out of a pure heart and of faith unfeigned, not to pretend to be something we're not, not to lie to people, but mm-hmm. to do what you want us to do based on the words that you say to us. And uh, just like he said, you, know, you talk to us every day. Don't let us ignore you and disobey you and disregard you. And we don't want to be ashamed that you're coming. And I pray that you'll please sanctify and keep all of us uh, clean and that our bodies and the flesh uh, won't cause us too much trouble between now and when you come and get us. Amen. I'm looking forward to it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.